Well, we will go ahead and get started. I know we're a little after the top of the hour here. So howdy, everybody. Um, welcome to our panel discussion. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the relationship between uh, businesses who rely on open source projects and the communities around those projects who sustain them and who make those projects so much more than just uh, a business tool. Um, you might think of it as like the ultimate technological situationship, right? It's tricky and it's tumultuous, this relationship. Um, it's often a minefield of misunderstandings and miscommunication. Uh, it can be one of those situations where, um, you know, sometimes you get what you need and sometimes uh, you're kind of entrenched in this situation where a uh, project has been around for years and, uh, and you just have to deal with things that have been there forever, whether that's technical debt or whether that's people. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom, right? Um, open source projects and communities are places where people and businesses, despite their differences, um, can create incredible things that are not only profitable and uh, personally fulfilling, but which are more impactful uh, than anything that anybody could have created uh, in isolation. And so that's kind of what we're talking about today. Uh, my name is Alan, excuse me, my name is Alan Smith. <laughs> I'm wearing a lavalier microphone, <laughs> uh, and I need to remember that. I lead developer relations in the United States here for a wonderful open source project called Umbraco. Woo! Woo! Uh, has anybody, besides my Umbraco friends here, <laughs> anybody here uh, heard of Umbraco before? Okay, yeah? Very cool, very cool. Uh, for anybody who hasn't heard of it, Umbraco is a content management system. It's built on .NET. Uh, it's completely free. It's open source, it's MIT licensed. It's been around for nearly a quarter century, which feels really weird to say it that way. Um, and it's been open source since 2004. So as open source projects go, it's actually kind of like a, a grandparent maybe, I don't know. It's been around for a while. It's a very mature open source uh, project with a very mature open source community. It's a unique ecosystem for a number of reasons, um, but one of the things that distinguishes it, I think, from other open source projects is the, uh, the warm, friendly, um, dare we say cheeky at times, uh, community of people who sustain the project. And I'm fortunate to have four of these community members here with us today. Um, and these folks bring a really unique perspective, I think, because they are not only highly active community members in the Embraco community, but they are also people who work with Embraco on a day-to-day -day basis in a business environment. Uh, so I think that they have a really unique perspective, and they have different jobs, too, which is really interesting. Um, different perspectives about how open source communities and businesses can kind of work together. Um, so I'm going to let folks uh, introduce themselves, but before I do, just a little bit of housekeeping here. We've divided... Oh, no, my laptop has gone to sleep. Yeah. We have divided our conversation into different uh, themes, which are about different facets of this relationship. So we're going to um, spend a little bit of time on each of these... Uh, themes, and then we'll have a little bit of time at the end where y'all can ask us questions if you'd like. Um, so with that in mind, um, I will let our panelists uh, introduce themselves. We'll start here with Janae. Does it work? Oh, it works. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'm Janae Cram. I am a .NET developer and a tech lead for ProWorks Corporation, which is a small but successful agency of eight whole people in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, we do quite well, and um, they are strong supporters of Umbraco, have been strong supporters of Umbraco for years before I started working there. I've worked in Umbraco for 15 years, but I have only been part of ProWorks for two. Hello. <laughs> I'm Blake Watt. Uh, I am actually a technical QA engineer, and I work with Umbraco at Diagram, who uses Umbraco for all sorts of things and different enterprise level clients. Um, <laughs> I've been working with Umbraco since about 2012, and I actually really enjoy working with it. I've gotten to do all sorts of things from like building stuff to training people, so I kind of have that range and I just really enjoy working with it, which is why I get involved. Hi, um, I'm Jen Wolke. I work for a digital agency called Blue Modus. Uh, we're a fully remote company, but based out of Denver. Um, 
I've been working with Embraco for about three years now, so not as long as these guys. So definitely learn a lot from these guys. But um, I'm kind of newer to the the Embraco community, um, and like I said, we're Blue Modus is a digital agency, and we use uh, a variety of CMSs, Embraco being one of them. Um, obviously, my favorite since I am here. <laughs> uh, but no, I I think it's a I really love the community around it, and uh, it's my kind of my first foray into working with open source. So it's been a very different experience. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Hi, I'm Jeremiah Vasquez. I'm the founder and CEO, which sounds really uh, comical in my own ears, of a little small uh, agency based out of Oregon called Turn Agency. I've been working with Umbraco since version four, and I think I just dated myself pretty heavily. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, Umbraco has been a, a, a really great product for our agency, uh, myself personally, and I'm just uh, thankful and honored to be here. All right. Um, thank you so much for being here, y'all. Uh, let's kick off our discussion today uh, we're talking about boundaries, right? Anytime you're talking about relationships, um, of any kind, boundaries are a really important topic to talk about. So they're one of the most foundational uh, concepts, I guess, if you think about community organizing. But I think in the open source world, there's something that we don't really have very clear language around very often. Um, you know, sometimes we have a code of conduct in projects and things like that, but it's really important to define who our community is. Where does our community begin and end? Uh, and so I guess that's maybe our first question is, how do, you, how do we draw lines around an open source community. Um, we talk about the Embraco community. What, what are the boundaries there? How do you know who's in the community? How do you know who's not in the community? Um, and who is the community comprised of? You know, we have CEOs, maybe we have designers, developers, end users. Um, we were talking about end users last night, right? Are end users part of your open source community? I don't know. Uh, and how do you find like a sweet spot, right? where it's maybe not quite a club or a clique or a cult, which Umbraco has been accused of being a cult. Don't tell anybody. Um, or something that's just like purely chaotic. There's a lot of open source communities that are out there like that, JavaScript. Um, <laughs> and you know, if you feel up to sharing, uh, talk about the other side of that too. Like how do you define the boundaries of a community within the individual, right? So in other words, if you're a member of an open source community, um, are you a member 24-7, or are you just a member of that community in the context of work? Do you clock out at 5 o'clock and no longer uh, a community member of that open source community? Um, who should we start with? Janae, do you want to chat a little bit? You start with me because I'm on the left. Oh, yeah. I have the mic. I'm always going to be a first. Uh, <laughs> um, I am a particular human being of incredibly strong boundaries. Um, I am a firm believer in work-life balance. I only work four days a week. That's my choice. Um, and that was something that I pitched to the company when we were talking about coming on and hiring me. And it wasn't optional. Um, so that was a decision that I made for myself. So I also have really strong boundaries when it comes to the variety of communities, including tech, that I'm involved in. Um, and I have strong feelings about that. However, I do not only work um, on Umbraco as a community member during my work hours. I also run a magazine for Umbraco that we've had going for, we just had our ninth birthday, right? Yeah, our ninth, yeah, for nine years now. Um, and all of the work that I do on that, I do on my own time from writing newsletters to sourcing authors to um, encouraging community engagement and highlighting festivals that are happening in Umbraco. There's a lot going on around the world. So um, in those cases, I think it's really important to set boundaries for yourself um, and um, make sure that you don't push yourself into burnout by trying to contribute too much as for who's in the community and who's not, I think that's kind of a self-identified thing. You know, you get to choose where you fit, but I think that Umbraco, I mean, friendly is one of the mottos that we have, um, is a community where literally everyone is welcome as long as you follow the code of conduct. So as the moment that you engage in Umbraco from, you know, 
entering something in on the website, installing it, or you know, even reading an article about it, that might mean that you're suddenly a member of the community if you feel like you're a part of it. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Can I, can I follow that up with, with Jeremiah? Because I mean, Jeremiah, you're a, you describe yourself as a founder and a CEO, and that's different, I would say, than a lot of people in developer communities. Um, yeah, you, you don't want me coding right now. <laughs> <laughs> you can hire my agency to do that, but you don't want me doing it personally. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you certainly don't want me. Um, yeah, it is a different role. Um, I'm, I'm constantly promoting, advocating for um, open source in general, but also especially on Braco. Um, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't feel compelled to, um, other than it's the best thing for the client, it's the best thing for this use case, it's the best thing for the users or whatever the project is. But I never feel compelled to it. I think. Um, that's something a little unique to Mbaka. Yeah, for sure. Does anybody have something else to add? Um, yeah, just to kind of follow up with, uh, with what Janae said, I, I think for me, being new to the community, it's kind of you're as much a part of the community as you want to be, at least with Umbraco. I've felt very, it's been, it's been really interesting because I've worked in closed source up until this point in my career, which is you know 25 years, so I, I felt very welcome. It's like if you want to participate, you can participate in any way you want, for any amount of time you want. Um, so I think in terms of who's in the community and who's out, it's like like Janai said, it's kind of self-identified. It's to the degree that you want to be involved. Um, uh, like I said, this is my only open source community I've been part of, so I I don't know how others are, but I would assume. When, when you're building something that's that starts out more of you know a passion than a business because that's kind of what most open source starts as you you build it because you love it and you want other people to know about it and be involved so I think you're always gonna take anyone who wants to be a part of the community granted they're you know respectful and follow the code of conduct um, so I, th I I agree that it's very um, self-identified and and most of those communities are really open to embracing other other ideas and community members for sure just to piggyback off of that it's very to echo what you've been saying like you set your own boundaries based on knowing yourself and how much you want to give but the beauty of the community is that everyone can be part no matter what your skill set is, you can contribute to it. So that's the awesome thing about it. And it, everybody's so friendly. <laughs> so getting involved in the community is really, like, really easy to do because you can write a blog, you can talk to somebody, just have conversations and talk about how you use things and anything, really. I mean, it's, it's actually a lot of fun to sit and nerd out with people and get <laughs> and just be involved in the community. And... Um, as far as the boundaries go, it's really just based on how you feel. If if you are like, okay, I've had enough, I want to clock out, go for it. No one and then nobody holds that kind of thing against you. So you just kind of know yourself, and it's a lot of fun to be in this community. <laughs> yeah, one thing I've noticed myself just so I came from uh, outside the Embraco community, and I've been involved maybe a year, a little over a year. And I've noticed that there's, you know, there's open source communities where you have like a core repository and everything kind of takes place within that core repository. And Bronco is not like that. Like there are so many different contribution pathways that exist beyond just the code. And I know people talk about that, um, but that is something that I've noticed is that people have so many opportunities to contribute in different ways. And I think that has grown the community too. It gives people opportunities to, um, to find that way that they feel personally connected to the community. Um, I think um, Braco in particular that I've seen has a really clear um, communication about that though. Like the, a pull request isn't the only way to be part of, uh, or to be a contributor. 
um, um, like uh, during Hacktoberfest, when all month we're trying to have people engage with, you know, writing code for Umbraco, we also list a bunch of things that mean that you're a contributor um, and you're not writing code. Maybe you wrote an article or you wrote a blog post or you're doing other things that aren't pull requests, but that still are meaningful to everybody. And that absolutely counts as a contribution. Yeah, totally. Like there's a guy in the UK who just makes t-shirts in his spare time, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like, I just think that's cool. Like that's nobody awesome. asks him to do that. He just does that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's switch gears. This has been, this is great so far. Um, we got to talk about baggage, right? <laughs> We've all got baggage, right? Open source communities are no exception to this. Um, so a rich history uh, is kind of the great double-edged sword in open source, right? Because um, especially open source projects that are either widely adopted or long-lived, and Umbraco is both um, because it's been around so long and because it's so highly adopted. Um, with that in mind, I I'd like to know what kinds of baggage y'all have encountered. So we have people with different experience levels with Umbraco, both as a technical project, but then also as a community endeavor, we'll say. Um, yeah, I'm curious to see what kind of baggage you've encountered. Um, and also because, uh, because we're folks who use Embraco in a business environment, um, I'm curious to hear about challenges, either, uh, you know, like community friction or even technical debt that has impacted your ability to, say, serve clients or work on client projects. You don't have to give specific, you know, names or anything like that, but... Um, I'm curious to hear about how that baggage has influenced your ability to thrive in this community. Um, and of course, if you want to approach the question from the other side of that sword too, um, how can baggage be a good thing? Like, are there things that we have in this community that you might consider baggage that are actually, you know, helpful for us in the long run? Um, Janae, I hate to, to start with you again. Uh, Do you want to take yes. Time? Do you want to start? Um, I have a thought. Yeah, so, Jen. yeah let's Jen. Jen. So the, something that you just said was really kind of sparked a thought for me is yeah. the baggage that then impacts the business. And there's, for, for this made, contextually it may not make sense for the people who haven't used Umbraco, but there's this thing called the grid editor. And that has caused, as a, as a newer user of Umbraco, I kind of came in in that period where the grid editor disappeared. The, whatever version that was. I think it was eight. But I have all these clients that are like, I want to use the grid editor. And I'm like, but why? I don't understand why. Because, and also, like, you're in version eight, so you can't because it's not there. And it, and it seemed, and I don't know the whole history and because I'm newer. And so this is definitely baggage. But I don't know, like, I have some theories on why it went away and why it came back. But I like it's hard for me to talk to clients about that because I have clients who were like pre version eight, like version seven, and they're in love with it. And I'm like, okay, but I don't I don't understand why. And that they, they got stuck in this mindset because it was there. And then it seems like Umbraco tried to and again, this is where I don't have that backstory. Umbraco tried to kind of shift away from it because they were trying to encourage people in a different path. But because it was there, like, our clients are dead set that that's what they want to do. And I'm trying to navigate, like, trying to pull them along and be like, well, that's really not how we want to do this. But they're like, but, but, but it's, it's there. I want it. Um, so that's where I can see that, like, being new or not having that and this baggage is there. And I'm like, I don't understand. I don't know what to do with this thing because... I don't understand, you know, the whole the whole evolution of it. It's like there's a whole history there. Right. Yeah, there's a yeah. history, and I don't really understand all of it. Um, and I'm just trying to do what's best for the client now <laughs> and convince them that this maybe isn't the path they want. The great editor um, is called technical debt. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts. Well, I think that. Um, Innovation always has change, and change always makes people need to have a new mindset. And that 
when you uh, have a routine that gets you through your business practices, then innovation and change, which may improve your business practices, don't always seem convenient at the time in which the change is happening. <laughs> and I think that that's a large part of that. Um, because learning takes extra labor. And so when you have to attack that on, then you're looking at the additional labor, even if it is a better product. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I, no, I mean, I have so much baggage I can talk. <laughs> I do too. So. Do we need a therapy session? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I think baggage has a, a really negative connotation to it, but it doesn't have to. No. Right. And I think um, I think baggage, in terms of Mbaco, there's really kind of some good baggage. So I, when I joined the community, I don't know that I, I don't recall that happening. I don't recall it being like an initiation or something. But you didn't but get hazed. I didn't get hazed. <laughs> Uh, but the first time I went to Code Garden, I did not feel like a, a newcomer. And there were all these little, like the hashtag high fiver and, you know, all these little uh, umbracoisms were there. And I was slowly introduced to them, but I never felt like that baggage was, uh, or that history, uh, I, I didn't feel alienated from it. And so I, was, I, I don't know, like baggage just has this connotation that I would love to kind of lose a little bit. Like, it can be good. It's called a rich history. A rich history. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good way to frame it. I mean, you know, you've got like lore, right, inside the community. Um, you know, and it's not, it doesn't have to be baggage, but I mean, there's rituals and there's tokens and like little things and stories. You know, like there's this whole story about version five of Umbraco, which did not exist, right? It, 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 <laughs> it did. Right. And they had a funeral. I for think it. there was an alpha. Okay. <laughs> um, but there was a funeral, yes. <laughs> Um, and so little things like that, I think, add richness to, um, to the community and to the project itself. I mean, I think it's the stories that keep things alive beyond just the technical problems that we're solving. I think there is risk there, though, mm -hmm. like, um, especially for, um, like, Jen, you are much newer. We love having you, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, um... And for those of us who have seen some of these hiccups that, you know, things have gone through, like whole versions that have been canceled and had funerals, um, there's a headstone, uh, literally. Um, <laughs> and um, also like the decision making that, you know, you didn't necessarily follow along with for like certain choices for framework usage. Or, um, and, and then there's a lot of conversations that you have around that and then someone who joins, you know, up to be a part of those conversations later could feel that they're excluded because they don't have the history there, you know, and people are talking about, oh, remember when? And they're like, I don't remember when. I wasn't there for that. And there has to be active choice to include those people in those conversations to continue to make them feel welcome. Yeah, that's a great point. You have to be like uh, intentional about it. Otherwise it is a click. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, anybody have yeah. any? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on real quick here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about trust, appreciation, and commitment, because these things, it's like a trio, right? This is critical to any healthy collaborative relationship, whether we're talking about open source communities or regular relationships or anything else. Um, open source communities are unique, I think, in a lot of ways, but in one way, um, because they're comprised of people and businesses who, uh, you know, in any other universe might be competing with each other, but instead they're doing things together that help their collective future. And I think that's one thing that makes open source really powerful. Um, so I, I think it's interesting though, it creates an interesting dynamic to navigate as a professional because you're working in two different realms. You have this very competitive business realm, but then you also have this very collaborative um, open source realm. And I'm wondering how you navigate that dynamic as a professional uh, working here, right? So when is like, when is the NDA less beneficial than the friend, friend DA, right? Don't know about the friend DA? Yeah. Uh, 
And so taking that a step further, talking about um, commitment, right? How can a business encourage impactful contributions to an open source community among its employees? Um, and then maybe if we come at this from the other side, right? Uh, when you have an environment where there are competing interests and people have different levels of influence and control, like how do you navigate that inevitable gridlock between competing interests in a way that's fair and equitable to everybody? Um, Blake, I know we chatted a little bit about this yesterday. Can I start with you? Because you had a really interesting story about uh, a couple of different work environments. Yes. So um, I've actually had the opportunity to work at agency, two different agencies with two different mindsets and how you work together and share things, which has been really interesting from navigating, trying to be involved in the community and share things and share how I work with Umbraco and my experiences with it versus when you're in an environment that's very competitive where there was like three agencies in this area that did this and they did not talk to each other. They weren't friends. <laughs> Actually, there's some backstory on one where it wasn't healthy. <laughs> so um, it was it was a little tricky because there'd be like things where it's like, okay, well, let's write blog posts or we have this package, we could share this where it was like, no, we don't really want to put that out there. So it's kind of hard to get them to get involved. Whereas where I'm at now is like share all the things, do all the stuff, go get involved, have fun with it. And it totally different. <laughs> but um, it the like health of these areas was like totally, totally vastly different. So one company actually really struggled to promote Umbraco and use it on a regular basis, ended up actually kind of dying off from using it as much where they used it for years and years. But then they, I almost feel like it's because they didn't adopt <laughs> said strategy to be involved and work with it and just have fun. And it didn't go that way. So Whereas I'm at now, they're working with it all the time. We actually get to go do fun stuff like this and talk to people and share our experiences. And so navigating these things has been really, really tricky because there's not like a one size fits all solution for how you handle it. You just kind of feel it out. Be like, oh, if I share this, is that cool? <laughs> so it ends up working out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's interesting seeing the different sides of how people handle this kind of thing. Yeah. For sure, um, it is. It's, it's interesting to see how different levels of investment can can pay off in different ways. Jeremiah, I know earlier today we were talking about um, somebody who works at Turn, and you were talking about how there's an opportunity for that person to contribute to Umbraco right through new trainings and things like that. Um, is that something that is, uh, I guess, beneficial to you as somebody who runs an agency that there's contribution pathways that help people, you know, have different levels of professional fulfillment or growth? Yeah, so my, my agency history previously has been uh, all content management systems and uh, Adobe Experience Manager and Sitecore <clears throat> were the two really big um, offerings we've done. And I, I bring that up because it's a completely different world. And I don't know if this is because it's on Braco, or because it's open source and not closed source, but it's completely different now. Um, I've, I've worked in conjunction with PoWorks, you know, uh, over the years. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, we've, we've collaborated, we, we've, we've traded code ideas, we've like hit each other up for architectural help. Um, that's completely different. Uh, coming from Sitecore in the Yummy uh, industry, that is cutthroat and you would certainly never offer to help another, you know, a rival. So it's, it's a lot of it, though. I don't, I don't know if I'm really hitting your question there. Well. No, but that's still a great point. Like, I mean, I think that's it's good to... And you bring up another interesting story that I've heard just anecdotally. That is something that happens a lot in the Embraco community. You hear about agencies who should be competing with each other, who mm -hmm. um, basically pass clients off to each other. If they can't serve them well, or they know that somebody could solve the problem really well, they'll just they'll hand the work over. Because it's it, I don't know if it's that it's not about the money, it's about the community. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something to be said for that, I think. Being supportive instead of competitive, yeah. actually helping each other out. Well, that helps me out. I mean, <laughs> if I'm overworked, why uh -huh. are we adding another project on? <laughs> uh -huh. Like, if someone else 
needs that work, then let's pass that RFP on to a friend, right? Like yeah. that's a, a much better choice, you know? Um, and if we have availability and your company is super busy and you have a project you simply can't take on right now, then maybe it's a good fit for us. And that's an excellent business relationship, right? We, uh, we also contract with other companies frequently to when we need additional um, people to, you know, add to our code base. Um, but also... Um, I have, I've always worked for small companies. I think the largest company that I've worked for was 10 uh, over my 15 years. And those, that is an entire different conversation about pros and negatives of small businesses. But um, this one, as all of them actually, but this one in particular is um, like everything is company time. Um, they see complete value in supporting open source, which I don't think is necessarily unique, but I think it's um, more common in smaller business than in larger companies. Yeah, um, when I told my boss, I, I told him really more than asked him um, that I was going to come and do this panel. He was like, that's great for us. Good, go, right? And that's how he feels about basically all our contributions to Umbraco. It he said, it only benefits ProWorks that you do these things. Yeah. Yeah, so do you only do Umbraco now? No. You still do those other, you still do Sitecore and, or Sitefinity, do you Sitecore or Sitefinity, sorry. If, it, if it's in the best interest of the client or the client has constraints, sure. Yeah. So as a follow-up to that, how do you kind of navigate that you've got closed source and open source at the same time? So you've got this area where it's more open and collaborative, and then you've got these other areas. How do you... Because to me, those are competing mindsets, and it would, in my opinion, it would be really hard to manage that at the company level. So I'm just curious how you you kind of navigate that. This is going to sound so canned, but it's really it's really about the client. It's it's really what the client needs, and that's going to dictate what we do. And it, a lot of times, we can show a client. Uh, I'm a, this is going to sound like a sales pitch. Sorry, but a lot of times I can show. Uh, Sitecore or AEM and say, okay, this is how you would do this in this CMS. This is how you do it in Umbraco. It's kind of the same, it's really similar, or if not better. And also, you can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in licensing and use that for something <laughs> yeah. like design or, or content strategy or something nice. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, no, this is wonderful. That's what this is about. No. Oh, hey, it makes my job easy, right? Uh, we, will, um, we will switch gears to another topic here. We're running almost out of time. Just a quick update for everybody. Uh, Skip is sleeping right now. He's taking a little sniff. He's snoring. Uh, so something that kind of coincides with uh, trust, appreciation, and commitment uh, is this idea of accountability. Um, that's another big, important component of any uh, trusting relationship. Um, so in a dynamic like an open source project where you have um, what you might consider shared ownership of a project, but um, where resources and influence sometimes are vastly different from one person or company to the next, how do we ensure that everybody gets a fair shake in the open source community? And more importantly, when a project is maintained primarily by you know, one entity, one company, um, what can the community do to keep that company in check? How can the community ensure that the company is a good steward of the project? Um, and for the companies who rely on an open source project, what duty do they have to shoulder a portion of the burden of maintaining that open source project over time? Or to put that another way, like, is it ethical to profit off of what is essentially free labor? Sorry, this was a little hard hitting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not going first. <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to go first? <laughs> I have opinions on everything, it's fine. <laughs> um, like I said in the very beginning, I have very strong boundaries. So um, I am, oh my goodness, I can hear him snoring. Um, 
I have very strong boundaries. Um, so, for example, the magazine that I run for Umbraco, um, when I took my most recent job, that was in my contract that there was no overlap of interest about that magazine, right? Like, I take that kind of thing very seriously. I think that setting boundaries is really important for accountability, right? You can't be accountable about something if you don't actually know what you're being accountable for or to what level. So having boundaries set for you is really helpful for that. Um, but outside of maintaining the magazine, I don't work on Umbraco on my off hours. Um, the company actually pays for us to do those things. And I think that that is a very healthy ecosystem because, um, as an individual, my time and money is a lot harder for me to sink the cost of than a corporation. And so the corporation's responsibility for maintaining the healthy ecosystem also maintains healthy developers and healthy community members. So I really feel that that falls on the company to help maintain healthy boundaries for their employees and therefore have a healthy ecosystem in their open source projects that they're dedicated to. I mean, if we're getting a free license, then we should give back in other ways. Yeah. <laughs> well, and um, I feel like Umbraco, the core project itself, is free. And they have their proprietary packages that you have to pay for, so, which is a separate thing. And having the community like we use GitHub, go through that process. We can request features. So the core team themselves can be like, okay, well, we have this path. We're maintaining some of this, but maybe we can outsource some of these features. So giving a guidelines for that to help, that's kind of like, okay, well, the community can be accountable for this. It's kind of essentially like project management in a way, could, I guess could be more formal, but they can, they definitely take their ownership of their core products and things that are like the paid style. And then I don't, I wouldn't consider it profiting off of open source just because it's still free at the end of the day. And that's the product that people are coming for and using and really love. So, yeah. yeah because, well, y'all, we are out of our time for our conversation today. It's been a wonderful conversation, I feel like. We didn't get to our last question, which was about how do we build the future together. Um, but what y'all should do is we're going to be sticking around uh, up on the fifth floor. You can come to the Embraco booth and chat with us. You can come see Skip. He's wonderful. Uh, but come see us. Come chat with us about Embraco. Chat with us about open source. We love chatting about all, all things you know, fun, technical, nerdy, non-nerdy. Um, it's, it's fun. The other thing I will mention, um, uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Embraco community, you can scan this QR code right here. It'll let you sign up for our community newsletter. Uh, we won't spam you. We just send you info about Embraco. And the last thing, if you uh, are going to be in the States in October, scan this QR code if you can. I don't know if that is cut off. Uh, there's going to be an Embraco US Festival in Chicago, Illinois this year in October. Um, and we would love it if you could make it out there. Um, but uh, please give a warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all so much.